let's get go from the current slide. This is where we left off last time. But before we get going here, let me go over a few announcements. I can't remember if I did these or not. I've been forgetting them for most of my classes, but I probably this may be the only class I did them, so you don't hear them again. Um, <clears throat> coming up February 12th, that's what, a couple weeks away. Uh, about four weeks away, maybe three or four. Um, Wednesday, February 12th, from 9.30 to 11.30, on the Birmingham West Campus, the academic building, which is the B Hall, <coughs> sorry, is Lost to Sake uh, Community College, College Transfer Fair Days, okay? Boy, lots of words there. 2020. Uh, the, the tables will be set up all up and down the B Hall there. It's a long hallway. Uh, and they will be set up and all these, a bunch of these schools will be there. Then on Thursday, February 13th, at one, uh, two or three weeks from, to, three or four weeks from tomorrow on this campus, they'll be set up, I think, in the faculty staff dining room. I'm not certain of that, but I'm guessing that's where it is. They say it's in the cafeteria, but that's an awfully small space and that's at the end of uh, breakfast and the beginning of lunch. I sort of don't think they're going to be in the cafeteria then, but you'll find out. I'm sure they'll get closer. Here are some of the institutions that have been invited to attend. AUM, Mississippi State, University of Alabama, Montevallo, Alabama State, Alabama A&M, University of West Georgia, Auburn, uh, Jacksonville State, Stillman College, William Carey University, uh, UAB, University of Alabama in Huntsville, University of West Alabama, Troy University, University of South Alabama, University of Alabama College of Continuing Studies, so not just UA, they will be here, have a table, but they also have continuing, College of Continuing Studies will have a table. Athens State, UAB will be here, but also the UAB School of Health Professions, University of North Alabama, Samford, Alcorn State, Kentucky State, Tennessee State, Faulkner University, Southeastern Bible College, Talladega College, and Georgia Southwestern State University. Wow. Uh, so that's coming up February 12th on Birmingham and 13th on this campus, Birmingham campus, West campus, B Hall on this campus. I think it's the faculty staff dining room. Okay. Now, this is something especially for you guys, okay? Um, this is from a guy named Mr. Joseph Muskin. Uh, he's at University of Illinois, and he runs a summer research program for the Center for Power Optimization of Electrothermal Systems. That acronym is POETS. Okay, so it's the POETS Society. No, no. Uh, we are looking to recruit minority engineering students to work at three of our four institutions this summer, University of Illinois, University of Arkansas, or Howard University. So 10-week internship exposes undergraduates academic research in fields of mechanical, electrical, materials, engineering. Students are paid a $5,000 stipend, receive free housing, receive airfare, gain access to weekly professional development uh, webinars, as well as other benefits. And there's a brochure here. You're certainly welcome to look at that. Now, I pieced it together. It's on a couple of backward pieces of paper and stuff, but I think you should follow, follow it out, follow it up, follow it, uh, whatever I'm trying to say. Okay. Now, I'm not going to read all this to you, but the big date is application deadline is February 15, 2020. Uh, it's the National Science Foundation Engineering Research Center on the Power Optimization for electrothermal system poets research. Um, so, they, it's a great learning opportunity. They pay you to have it. They house you to have it. I think usually with housing, they usually feed you to have it. They provide your airfare one trip there and back. It's a great deal. Uh, 
you work in a university research lab, and again, the deadline is February the 15th. Okay? So, if you want further information, anything you want to know, you can either find here or get a link to it there. Okay. Uh, we just got Dawson in and Josh in. Only missing Ryan. <clears throat> and by the way, I was called this morning to see if I thought we ought to cancel this class. And absolutely not. <laughs> okay, so uh, I said that several of you needed to graduate. I hope I was telling the truth then. Uh, but I, actually, what I said was well, it depends on whether we really are serious about the QEP. That's <clears throat> completion. If they don't have it, they don't complete. They go on to the four-year school. What do you think? They say, okay, I understand. I, anybody, okay, so. I hope I wasn't overstating it. Well, not too bad. <laughs> okay, anyway. Now, last time we started talking about, oh, first, any questions on anything we've covered so far? We haven't covered a lot, but any questions? All right. We're in uh, chapter 10, which is conic parametric equations and capolar coordinates. Basically, we're just doing the parametric equations part. Example 3 on page 7, 12, oh, the section is 10.3, parametric equations and calculus. And uh, on page 712, example 3 uh, is this one you see here, and it's also located at larsoncalculus.com for an interactive version of this type of example. And here is a prolate cycloid given by these two parametric equations. We talked about this before. And it just tells us it crosses itself at the point 0, 02. Okay? And I think we verified that last time, didn't we? When T is 0, then this is 0, that's 0. So 0 works there. When uh, uh, what, uh, t is 0 here, uh, cosine of 0 is pi hat, and cosine of 0 is 1, so that's 1, oh, I'm sorry, sorry, I was doing the backwards, okay, this is x, y, 0, 2, okay, where is x equal to 0? Well, x equals 0 when t is equal to 0. So we did that right. When t is equal to 0, we plug that in there. And I don't get a 2. Okay. Uh, cosine of 0. See, 0 works there. X is 0. Oh, that's the one down here. I remember now. That's the one down there. That's not the point we're interested in. We're interested in that. Uh, T actually has three places where, uh, at least three places where X is equal to 0. Okay, so let's pick another one. Maybe easier to do this. Where is Y equal to 2? Well, Y is equal to 2 when, when this term is 0. Well, for this term to be 0, Cosine would have to be zero. Cosine is zero at minus pi halves and plus and pi halves. So that makes this a zero. A minus pi halves here, we give you uh, minus pi, and then sine of pi halves is one, minus pi, uh, pi minus pi is zero. So the x is zero. When t is equal to minus pi halves, this will be a negative pi, and sine of minus pi halves is a minus, so 1, so that would be minus, a minus pi is plus pi minus pi, that's also 0. But sure enough, we've got, crosses itself at those, that point, 0, 2. When t is equal to positive pi halves and minus pi halves says find the equations of both tangent lines at that point. Okay? <clears throat> Do you remember what the equation for the tangent lines are? Let me get my pen set up. And my 
again, this is asking for. Right, okay. It says the equation of both tangent lines at that point. So we certainly need to know the slope to know the equation of y. The slope is given by dy dx. So what is dy dx in terms of your parametric equations? dy dt over dx dt, which hopefully is what makes sense to you. You can actually think about canceling out the over tds and you've got dy dx again. So let's first figure out what dy dt is. dy dt is equal to is equal to Second, pi times the sine of t. Perfect. Now remember the two places we're interested in is t is equal to minus pi halves and t is equal to positive pi halves. Those gave you this point there. Okay? So there's your dy dt is, is pi sin, times the sine of t. What is your dx dt? Two minus cosine t. Okay, right, got it. And let's evaluate that at both places. Okay, minus pi halves. What is the sine of minus pi halves? Would that be? What is the sine of minus pi halves? A little louder. Negative one times pi would be negative pi. So there's the numerator. And what's dx dt at t equal minus pi halves? Okay, so that would just be 2, is that what you said? Yeah. So then what is your dy dx at t equal minus pi halves? Surprise, surprise. Minus pi halves. Okay. Now that gives you the slope of the line and this happens to be this one here. When t is equal to minus pi halves, its slope is minus pi halves. Strange but true. Um, now, what else do you need to find the equation of the line that that affects? You got its slope. What else do you need? Second, a little louder. You don't need that to get the tangent line. It may be a very interesting thing to get, but to get the equation of a tangent line, there's no concavity in that. What gives you? What do you need to get an equation of a line? There's several different possibilities. What's one of? Them? Especially since you've got a slope. Second, a point. Do we have a point? Do you have a point? No. Okay. What's the passing through? Zero two. Zero two. Of course we have a point. So, and that is a very special point. What point is that? Sitting on the y axis, so therefore it's the y-intercept, isn't it? Of any line that passes through that point, that's the y-intercept of it, okay? Except, of course, the vertical line, but that wouldn't have an intercept anyway, okay. All right, so which formula you want to use? A 
water? There's lots of equations for a line. I'll name a few. Two points. Uh, point slope we could use or slope. You were supposed to catch the ball here. I. I never would. Yeah, slope intercept form. Okay. Even field goal kickers should know that. Okay. All right. So slope intercept form. Which you want to use? Point slope or slope intercept? Let's not use point point. That's not helpful here. We only have one point. Slope intercept. How does that go? Oh boy. Wait a minute, we're through with uh, Math 100. We don't need to know that stuff anymore, do we? Y is equal to MX plus B. Okay, your M is negative pi over 2 times X. And what's your Y intercept? Plus Two. There is the one equation for the tangent line. That's the one going this way. Okay? Now, we need to do the same type of stuff for the other one. And I don't have a lot of room. So what I think I'll do is erase some of this. Okay? We've taken care of that one, so I'll just leave that. That will be the same. What we'll have is that. And we'll recalculate this. We'll recalculate that. We'll recalculate this. And we'll recalculate this. And this. Okay. So, for t is equal to pi halves, what is your dy dx? I think I shouldn't have erased that. <laughs> what was it? Pi times the sine of pi, the uh, sine of t, right? Okay. And this one, why, why did I, oh, this one. This was 2 minus I can't get my pen to write. Say again. Pi minus, or minus pi cosine t. Is that what you said? Yes. Okay, good. Should have left those there. This time we're going to plug in t equal positive pi halves. t is equal to pi halves, what sign of pi halves? Sign of pi halves. 1 times pi would be pi. Uh, and what's your dx dt when t is equal to pi halves? What is cosine of pi halves? 0. So this is just going to be 2. So this is pi halves. dy dx over dy dt over dx dt. Okay? So... Now we have y is equal to pi halves, that's your slope, x, and then the y-intercept's the same, plus 2. So that's the line that goes this way, and this is the line that was a negative slope that way. Does that make sense? All right. <clears throat> that should be example 3, and they get... Weird way to write them, but they, they, that's correct. You could say y is equal to, y minus 2 is equal to minus pi halves x. That gives you that one. Add 2 to both sides, you got it. Or y minus 2 is equal to positive pi halves x, and that gives you that one. Okay. Now, they do have a little blurb here at the bottom 
Uh, oh, wait, let's go on and watch them do it. Okay? Because x equals 0 and y is equal to 2 when t is equal to plus or minus pi halves. So first thing we had to determine, where does that occur? At pi halves and negative pi halves. Then you take your derivatives like we did. dy dx is dy dt over dx dt. They took those derivatives and found it to be pi times the sine of t over 2 times pi times the cosine of t. Um, and when dy dx is equal to minus pi halves when t is minus pi halves and pi halves when t is pi halves. Strange but true. So the two tangent lines would be plug in. They did point slope formula, which is a little bizarre. Uh, so much e easier to use slope intercept form, but uh, they use point slope. Okay, so we came up with the same two equations here. We just wrote it in different forms. Okay, now the next little thing here says if dy dt equals 0 and dx dt is not equal to 0. So if the numerator is 0, the denominator is not 0, when t is equal to t naught, some value of t, then the curve represents y is equal to f of t and y is equal to g of t has a horizontal tangent at f of t naught, g of t naught. Okay? For instance, in example 3, the given curve has a horizontal tangent at the point 0, 2 minus pi. Okay. when t is equal to 0. Similarly, if dx dt is equal to 0 and dy dt is not equal to 0, when t is equal to t naught, then the curve represented by x equal f of t and y is equal g of t as a vertical tangent uh, at that t0. If dy dt and dx dt are simultaneously 0, no conclusion can be drawn about the tangent line. A lot of blah, blah, blah without too much import there. Okay, so let's move on to arc length. Now, I don't know if you remember it in one dimensions. Um, but they do take you through a few steps before they get to this theorem 10.8. Let's see if we can get there without. If you have a smooth curve, C, given by x equal f of t and y is equal g of t. Now what do we mean by smooth curves? Maybe we need a little review on that. Anyone remember what a smooth curve is? Anybody? Just hazard a guess? It's like doesn't do any sharp corners. Ah, very good. That's a really good way to put it. No sharp turn. So no corners, no cusps, or anything like that. Now, the other way to say that, you have continuous first derivative. Okay? Smooth curves. Uh, no uh, sharp bends, cusps, corners, things like that. Okay, so that's the smooth curve C given by x equal alpha t, y is equal g of t. That's your two parametric equations. Such that C does not intercept itself on the interval from A to B, T going from A to B. So that last one we did, it did intercept itself uh, when T was between minus pi halves and pi halves. Okay? And outside of that as well. Except possibly at the end point. So when I said minus pi halves and pi halves, that would have been okay for this one. Then the arc length of C over the interval is given by... Now remember, your t is going from a to b, and your arc length, the, the variable, the independent variable is your t, so it's tt, so this is going from a to b. Now they could touch at the endpoints, but nowhere else. It can't cross between them, okay? Now, the 
this. The square root of the x dt squared plus the y dt squared. This derivative squared plus that derivative squared. Now, and they just rewrote it saying exactly what I did. The x dt squared is f prime of t squared plus g prime of t squared. The square root of that times dt. Now, um, I don't know if you remember how that came about. But let's say we have a curve here, okay? And we break that curve into little increments, okay? Um, The arc, the total length of that would be the sum of all these little increments. But those little increments, if they're small enough, they approximate the straight line. Okay? And that straight line is given by the distance formula, which basically is something pretty close to that. And so you're summing all of those up over all your keys, and that's what you get. All right, so real quick and dirty. I think that's what the um, stuff at the bottom of page 112 was leading you to. So we just went here. We'll stay there. Okay. They do have a little remark. When applying the arc length formula to a curve, be sure the curve is traced out only once in the interval. Otherwise, it's repeating itself. And we don't allow that. Um, for instance, the curve given... The circle given by x equal cosine of t and y is equal to sine t is traced out once on the interval 0 to 2 pi. But it's traced, is traced out twice, that's hard to say, uh, on the interval 0 to 4 pi. Because so you go through it once and then go through it again. So be sure you only do one. In the preceding si section, we saw that a circle rolls along a line, then the point on its circumference, this is one of the last things we did the last term, will trace a path called a cycloid, and if the circle rolls around the circumference of another circle, the path of the point is an epicycloid. Okay? It says the next example shows how to find the arc length of that epicycloid. Okay. So let's see if we go there. Oh man, there I just was saying all that is written here. So blah, blah, blah. So here's what we've got. Example four. A circle of radius one that's these circles here. Okay, radius one, you see, this is zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. They have a radius of one, diameter of two, but radius of one. Okay? Circle of radius one rolls around a circumference of a larger circle of radius four. One, two, three, four. Yeah. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Radius four. Anywhere along there. Okay? The epicycloid traced by a point on the circumference of the smaller circle is given by, and here's that, but. We're going to start with it here, and as this ball rolls this way, it, it picks up and goes through here until it reaches its maximum here, and then keeps on rolling around until it touches again here, and here, and here, and here. Do you think our formula that we were just talking about here is appropriate to use for that epicycloid. This curve here. Bing, 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 bing. Is that theorem appropriate to use? Yes. How? It doesn't intersect itself. Okay. Doesn't intersect itself. It's a straight curve. Is it? Not 
these places here are called cusps. But what can we do? Just do one cycle, uh, quarter cycle of the epicycle, okay? Go from here to here and multiply by four because these are symmetric, okay? So, as long as we restrict ourselves from t is equal to zero to t is equal to, I believe that's probably going to be pi halves, then I think we're going to be okay, okay? Now, They told us this is the um, are the parametric equations that trace that epicycle. X equals five cosine t minus cosine five t, and y is equal to five sine t minus sine five t. Uh, it says find the distance traveled by the point in one complete trip around the larger circle. Previous formula won't work, but we can use the previous formula just for one part of that cycle. Okay? And I think that's going to be zero to pi s. All right. So let's do it. What did the previous equation tell us? There it is. So that would be S is equal to the integral from, now where do we, zero to pi halves, we, I think that's it, okay? We might need to check that just to make sure. What's that? Yes, yes. We're going to do the four on the outside of this. Okay, hadn't gotten there yet, but we definitely will. Okay, let's check and make sure this is indeed. This point here has coordinates 4, 0. So let's see when uh, t is equal to 0, if that's what we get. What does this give us? Cosine of 0. Say again? 1, and that's 5. Okay, 5 minus... And cosine of 0 is 1, so 5 minus 1 is 4. That looks okay. Uh, for the x, let's do the y. When t is equal to 0, this is 0 and that 0. So uh, 4, 0 seems fine for that. Okay? Let's go up to the top one which we hope is at pi halves. Cosine of pi halves is zero. Pi times zero, of course, is zero. And cosine of... Uh, five halves pi. Cosine of five halves pi. Um, yes, it will be. Because every half pi is. Okay, so that the x is zero, and sure enough, the x is zero here. Okay, let's do this last one. Five times the sine of pi halves. What sine of pi halves? One. And five times one is five minus sine of pi five times zero of uh, five times pi halves. Five halves pi. What's the sine of pi halves? Good. Five halves pi. Say that again. Um, okay. What do you? Okay. I think it's just one. Okay, we got this to be uh, zero. That was fine. This one would be okay. Sine of. I'm sorry. Five times the sine of. And that's the sine. That's one. That's fine. This part is fine. And what did you say? Five to one and five minus one to four. Okay, I can't hear. <clears throat> Maybe one and then five minus one and four. Now that's what it looks like, but I'm 
and have yet to convince myself that's what we've got there. Five has pi. Yeah, because every odd half pi is positive. No, that's not. Yeah. Okay. Pi has pi minus pi has. I'm sorry. Three has pi. Zero. Five has pi. That's what I was looking at. It seems like to me that's a minus one, isn't it? Or did I do that wrong? It's five times pi halves would be five halves pi. One half pi, three halves pi, five halves. Oh no, it's possible. You're right. Okay. Five minus one is four. You got it. So yes, that works out perfectly. Okay. So we're okay with that. <clears throat> now, what's the next part? Got to take the derivatives of your parametric equations, square them, add them together, and take a square root. Remember, a lot going on with arc lengths. So let's first do x prime. What would that be? Anybody? Um, negative 5 sine t. Sine t. Plus 5. Well, plus. Wait. 5 sine 5t. Five sine 5t. Five five sine five t. Perfect. Rule, right? Say again? Is that the chain rule? Yeah, yeah, you're using chain rule. Perfect. The 5 came from the chain rule, and yeah. Okay. Let's also do y prime. that help me somebody five cosine, five cosine t. t that's a pretty ugly cosine minus, minus five cosine, five t. cosine five t all right got it now we've got to square both of those okay now both of them have a five coefficient. So let's factor that one out. Okay? So this will be 5 times minus sine t plus sine 5t and this will be 5 cosine t I can't write minus cosine 5t. Okay. So when we square these <coughs> x prime squared is going to be 25 times, what's that thing squared? Anybody? Square. So it's this thing squared. I did the 25 just to get rid of that. So what's in the parentheses squared? Sine squared t. Sine squared t. Okay, you got a cross term in there too. Let's go on and get that one done. Minus. Uh, twice the product of the two, two times sine t sine five t, then plus sine squared five t. Buy that? Okay. Let's do the same for y double prime squared. I mean y prime squared. If it'll ever come up, there it is. And that will be squaring this one. 
25, right? Times cosine squared g. Minus 2 cosine t cosine 5t plus cosine 5 cosine squared 5t. Okay. Now, those are your two things here. Okay. And we need to add them together. So let's do that next. I'll do it up here. Add these two together. Well, there's a 25 in each, so x prime squared plus y prime squared is equal to 25 times. Okay, now let's add those two together. Notice what these two give you. That one plus that one give you sine squared plus cosine squared. Y. Okay. And then we're going to add these two, and that's going to be a minus 2 sine t sine 5t minus 2 cosine t cosine 5t. That's a <laughs> cosine 5 became 5 and S became the same thing they shouldn't have, okay? Okay? And then sine squared 5t and cosine squared 5t again add to 1. So that will make 2 of those. And now you've got common factors of 2. You can pull that on the outside, and that will give you 50 times... One minus sine t sine five t minus cosine t minus cosine five t. Uh, I put an extra minus sign in there. That's a time sign. I think. Yeah, I can't read my own writing. Let me clean that up. I can't even read that, and I know what I was saying, and it didn't come out anywhere close to what I was writing. <sighs> Say that again. Yeah, yeah, I added the other one in there. Okay. Cosine T, cosine, I still can't write, 5T. Okay. I don't know if that's going to write or not. I think that's a little bit better. What's that again? No, you expect me to read that slot? Okay. Uh, this is a 50. You got from the 25 that was there, and then you factored out a 2, times 1 minus sine t sine 5t minus cosine t cosine 5t. Okay. What a big pain in the neck this thing. Okay. Now, what else do we do with that? Let's go back to our formula. Here we have the sum of those two, which we've got. But now we've got to take a square root of that sum. Big boo hiss. Okay? So we need to take a square root of this thing here. And that doesn't look like anything I really want to do. Uh, I will take the 25 out of this, square root of 25 is 5, and 5 times 4 is 20. So that's going to 
bring that to a 20. Okay. So I took that out. I still leave a square root of 2 in there. Okay? Yeah. Because 50 is 2 times 25. Square root of 25 is 5. Pull that out. Okay. Now, what we have now is this thing. The square root of 1 minus sine t sine 5t minus cosine t cosine cosine 5t. I have so much trouble writing that. Okay. dt. And that just disappeared. Okay. Now, okay, square root covers all that. And that was a 2, and somehow it became a 1. Okay. No, wait, 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 wait. I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. Let's pull the square root of 2 out and get it out front with the other. 20 root 2. Okay, because that square root of 2 is in there, let's get it on out of there, and then this goes back to being our 1 again. So I had that part right, but it didn't. So let's... Clean that up. Now, was there somebody? What's that? I thought that was a one because you took out a two and then you applied that two to the column of 50. So why do you put the square root of two in the next time? Okay. Okay. Do we agree that was the square root of 50 then? Yes. And that's square root of 25 times square root of two. And so I pulled the five out, but I left the two in there, and I thought, I don't want it in there anyway. Okay. But I may want it back there. They didn't do that. But let me check and see. Now, here is where the magic happens. Do y'all remember your difference formula for cosine? I sure don't. Okay. So what? I suggest is let's go back to um, the front inside cover of your text if you've got that and it's a trigon trigonometry page and I'm not even sure it's going to be here um, there I think it is there maybe well, they, it, they called it Uh, well, they call it the double, is it double angle formula? Difference formula for yeah, that's what they call it, difference formula for cosine. Um, and that sort of aggravates me, but... What's that? I, I can't hear you. Bottom left? Is that what you said? That may be it. Let's see if that's it. Yeah, that's it. When you use the minus sign. Okay. So that's cosine u cosine v plus sine u sine v. Yeah, okay. So it's what we have is a one, they have a two. Um, and that's equal to cosine Actually we're using the plus because they have the same signs there. Uh, 
cosine u sine u, cosine u, cosine v plus sine u sine v. They have a sine and a cosine that works the same way. And that comes up being cosine of u minus v. Or you u here. One of those is a 5t, the other is a uh, t, so the difference of those is 4t. So yeah, we'll take their word for it. Okay, <laughs> yuck. So let's see, this is two or 20 root 2 times the integral from 0 to pi halves times the square root of 1 minus cosine of 4t, right? Yeah. Okay. This is becoming a real pain in the neck. Okay. Ah. Okay. Let me narrow that down a little bit more. Okay, dt. Now, yeah. now, what we're going to do at that point is use the double angle formula, which you see on the right-hand column just below that circle they show there, the unit circle they show there. And we have that 1 minus cosine Four t okay. All right. I don't I don't have room enough to write all this down, but I'm gonna write it for you here. Cosine two u happy cosine two u is equal to we got we gotta pick the right one here. 2 times cosine squared u minus 1. 2 times cosine squared u minus 1. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. If your u is 2t, then this will fit perfectly except we want to change it a little bit. Let's change it this way. Um, 2 I'm not quite following this because your cosine if you added one to both sides that would give you that this is a pain okay add one to both sides you get that but that's not what you have here Oh, that's because I use the cosine. We want to use the sine. They just said double angle formula. I thought they meant double angle for cosine. We want this one. Um, it is double angle for cosine, but we want 1 minus 2 sine squared u. That's what we want. Okay, sorry about this. Okay. 1 minus sine squared u. Is that right? Cosine 2u is 
1 minus 2 sine squared u. 1 minus 2 sine squared u. All right, yeah. So what we do now is add the 2 sine squared u to both sides. That wipes it off of here. And subtract this to the other side. So this will be 1 minus cosine of 2u. That's the one we want. We have cosine 4t, so let the u be 2t. All right? So what, what we have is what, what's under there. I just don't have enough room to, to, to write this, but with this being 2t, then that would be 1 minus cosine 4t. Then you take a square root of this, and that would be the square root of 2 times sine of, and u was 2t. Yeah. Okay. And that's exactly what they, they got there. Okay? Now, pull this root 2 out with that one, and that two, root 2 times two, root 2 is 2 times 20 is 40 times the integral of from 0 to 2 pi. No, pi halves of sine 2t dt. Whew. Now, What's the antiderivative of sine 2t? Uh, so minus. Yeah, minus. So minus. Ah, I'm going to write some stuff. I'm just sick and tired of looking for places to write. Okay. Okay, this is taking way too long. I hate these problems that are so convoluted. Okay. Oh, no, that's where I love them. Okay. All right. Now, did you have a question or was that just a stretch? I was worried. So what happens from when you took from the first, uh, when it set up to... How do you get square root of 1 minus cosine 4t? Okay. Just right here? Yeah. Okay. Here's what we did. We took from the double angle formula in front of what, you know, that it says cosine of 2u was 1 minus 2 times sine squared of u. Okay. That's the double angle formula. One of the double angle formulas is cosine. There's three different ones. This is one that works best right here. So what I did, I took that and moved the sine, two sine squared u here, added that to both sides, and then subtracted this one here. So now I have something that looks like 1 minus, that's a cosine, it's ugly, 1 minus cosine of 2u, which is awfully close to what this is. So what I said was let u be 2t, and then that would be exactly what this is. Okay? So there's your 1 minus cosine of 2t, and that would be the same as 2 times the sine squared of 2t. So basically, that's what I did here. Okay? Well, I mean, uh, uh, I was trying to save space. I didn't have room to write. So this is this thing here becomes 1, uh, it becomes 2 times the sine squared of 2t. I have room. I should have written that in here. Okay. I say I have room. So this is 2 times the sine squared of 2t. That's what's in the radical. Okay. That's what I didn't write. Well, let's pull the square root of 2 out of that. Okay. And the square root of sine squared of 2t is sine t. So that becomes my integral. I took that square root out with this one, and square root of 2 times square root of 2 is 2t. 
two times 20 is 40. So that's where that came from. And then the rest of this integral stays the same, and this is times two times two. It was magic. Okay. But you see, it's all there. It's just really complicated. So how did you go from the one on top of it? This one? No, above it. Here. How did you get from that to square root of cosine of one minus cosine? Ah! Okay, that's the one we were just doing. And I, did I have it up there and then erase it? I'm afraid I did. Uh, but that was that uh, double angle formula. I'll, I'll go back and write that in again. Okay? Notes. Difference formula. Okay. It's cosine this is the lower right hand corner of that insert you know at the front of your book um, cosine of I'll write it just like they do u minus v is equal to goodness gracious this thing Drives me nuts. Okay. Cosine u, cosine v, minus sine u, sine v. No, plus sine u, sine v. Cosine u, cosine v, minus sine u, sine v. Okay. By that, that's the... the they said the difference angle formula for cosine. Okay. Now, what this is down here is 1 minus sine t sine 5t plus cosine t cosine 5t. Right? I just... Rearrange that, put them under a, you know, the radical is out in front, one is here, and then subtract those. Both of these are minus, you put that as a sum. Okay? Now, and that's a plus there, I don't know how it became a minus. My pen sometimes on the right when I'm on it. Okay. So here you have sine u sine v plus cosine u cosine v. Okay? And that's supposed to be cosine of u minus v. Well, if you let the u be the 5t and the v be the t, that would be 5t minus t is 4t. So that became... This thing right here became cosine of 40. And then you have the one out there. Okay? And then you just did the magic for that. Right. So now we're back to doing that interval. And I lost my space again, but let's try it. Um, that's 40 times, and what did you say the antiderivative of sine 2t was? Negative cosine 2t, for some reason, okay, over 2, isn't it? Anti-chain rule type thing? Okay. And we're going to evaluate that from 0 to 2 pi. I mean pi halves. Keep saying 2 pi. Okay. Now first we'll get rid of this 2 and make this a 20 again. All right. Now let's start with the pi halves. Cosine, 2 times pi halves is pi. What's well, cosine of pi? Negative 1. Minus that would be a positive 1. Okay? So that gives you a 1. Minus the cosine of 0. What's cosine of 0? One. And it's 
minus the minus. Minus because you're doing the lower one, but you have the minus there. So you say that's plus. So one plus one is, I love the math today, two. Okay. And two times 20 is 40. Okay, I didn't have room to write all that out, but hopefully you followed it. Yay? Okay, good deal. Was that worth it? <laughs> Don't answer that question. That was example four. Um, there is a little blurb on page 713. The arc length of an arch of a cycloid was first calculated in 1658 by British architect and mathematician not too famous a name, is it? Christopher Wren, famous for rebuilding many buildings and churches in London, including St. Paul's Cathedral. One of the most brilliant ar architects I think that's ever lived. Okay? And he calculated it, uh, I assume using calculus, but however. Okay, let's move on. Oh, here's how they do it. I wish I paid more attention to this. Oh. Before applying the theorem 10.8, note that the figure 10.33, the curve has sharp points at t equals 0, pi half, pi, 3 halves pi, and then back again at 2 pi, which is 0 again. We don't like the sharp points. So what we do between those any of those sharp points the dy dt and dx dt are not simultaneously zero, so they each are at various places, but because they're not at the same time, we can do the effect. So the portion of the curve generated between zero and pi halves is smooth. And we saw that. We looked at that and saw that. So we are going to do what they're going to do exactly what we did. To find the total distance traveled by the point, you can Find the arc length of that portion, 0 to pi halves, lying in the first quadrant, multiplied by 4. That's exactly what we did. And Fred, remember to put it out there. So here's your s is equal to 4 times the integral from 0 to pi halves of the square root of your squares of your derivatives uh, times the parametric form for the arc length. Okay. And the 4 is out here in this. And this form, the dx dt squared, was that. You square it, plus the y dt was that. Square it, just like we did. All right. Now, magic happens, right? Um, first thing we did when we squared these, you got a 25 here. Square those, you got a 25 there. Factor out a 25, that's a 5. And that gives you uh, 5 times 4 is 20. So that's where that came from. But you had sine squared t plus cosine squared t from this one, which is 1. And sine squared 5t plus cosine squared 5t from that one, which is 1. So that gave you a 200 here. You had the product of these two. You already factored out the 5, so they're out of there. Product of those two, the cross product gave you a minus 2 sine t, sine 5t, and this gave you a minus 2 cosine t, cosine 5t. Right. Now, 20 still out there. I went on and pulled the square root of 2 out too, but they didn't. Okay? But this is what we use. All they said is a different formula for cosine. Okay? And sure enough, it does work, but it requires a little more fill in the blanks than what they have here, okay? But indeed, that's what we wound up with. I pulled out the square root of 2. They didn't. And then they said this. Um, and you see, we're pulling out the square root of 2. You wouldn't have had to fiddle around and figure out what the 4 was. But anyway, they didn't and, and, and left it like that. And that gives you the square root of 4 times sine square root 2t. Now maybe that's nice, because that's a perfect square, that's a perfect square. Now they can pull the 2 out and make it a 40 there, which is what they did. And then this is just the integral of sine 2t, which is where we had it. And that integral is 
one half, so there goes your uh, 40 down to a 20, but it's a minus, so the minus can come out here too, and then I would have left the minus in here, but they did it. Cosine 2t. The one half is from the chain. Anti chain rule, you might say, from that. Okay, now you evaluate this, and this would be uh, minus 1, minus the minus 1, which is minus 2, times the minus 20 is a plus 40. And that's what they got. All right. For the epicycloid shown in that figure, an arc length of 40 seems about right because the circumference of a circle of radius 6. Okay, now where are they getting that? Um, kind of like this. That almost looks like it's the 4 plus 2. Probably a little bit more than that. The 4 plus 2 is 6. And you got part of the circle there, part of the circle here, part here, part here. Now those aren't exactly circles, but if if you smooth that around here, this would be a little bit longer than what we just described. And the uh, circle radius 6 would be, the circumference would be 2 pi times the radius. So that would be 12 pi. 12 pi is about 37, 38. Not too far off. This is less than this would be. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. What a pain. Now, let's look at the area of a surface of revolution. So I don't read it twice. You can use the formula for the area of a surface of revolution in a rectangular form to develop a formula for a surface, of area, surface area in a parametric form. That's not saying a whole lot to me, but it, it is true. Okay. The area of a surface of revolution is a smooth curve. Again, it needs to be smooth. C given by f of or x is equal to f of t, y is equal to g of t does not cross itself in an interval from A to B, then the area S, capital S here, of the surface of revolution formed by revolving C, this curve C, about the coordinate axis is given this way. So let's say the C, whatever it happens to be, is like this. You revolve that around the x-axis, you get a surface that looks sort of like a base or something. Revolve it this way, you get another surface. So here are the two ones. Um, if, this, if you're revolving around the x-axis, okay. Sort of think of it in this way. Remember, around the x-axis, your radius is your y value, right? You're revolving around the x-axis, the radius is the y value and your y value is the g of t. Okay? So the surface of revolution, 2 pi times that radius times that arc length. That's what you do it, that's a little arc length, and you're revolving those around. So the formula looks a lot like what we had before. This is your arc length, that's what you're revolving around. This is the radius you're doing. If you're revolving around the y-axis, then your radius is the x, which is the f of t. 2 pi times f of t times that same incremental arc length revolved around the y-axis. So sure enough, that's what they're trying to say up here. Using this formula for area of surface revolution in rectangular form, that doesn't say a lot to me, but that's what they, they mean of your regular intervals that we did late back sometime in the past. Okay. Now, these formulas are easy to remember if you think of the differential of the arc length. And that's what I was saying. The ds is that square root of dx squared. dx dt squared plus dy dt squared times dt. That is your increment of arc length. And that's what I was saying. That's what's revolving around. Then the formulas in theorem 10.9 can be written as Surface area is 2 pi, really shorten this, 
this thing here becomes just your dx. Uh, and that surely is how they look. That's not saying this is any easier to calculate. They look much neater, but that arc length parameter is a real pain in the neck to, to have to work with. T's are a lot better most of the time. All right, so here's example five. If it's as good as example four, I don't know what I'll do to myself. Let C be the arc of the circle. X squared plus Y squared is equal to three. I think equal to nine. From three zero to three halves, three root three over two. So here we have one, two, three. So there's a circle of radius three. Okay? Now, three zeros obviously on that. When your theta is 60 degrees, or pi thirds, okay, your x value is one half of this one, which is three halves, and your y value is uh, root 3 over 2 times uh, go back to your unit circle okay uh, call this 1 0 then when you're at 60 degrees or pi thirds then this point up here is 1 half and this one is root 3 over 2 Okay. And so you just multiply your radius by each of those. So that's the little arc length we've got. Okay? The little arc that we have. Shown in this figure. Find the area of the surface formed by revolving that curve, that little portion of the curve, about the x-axis. So you've got this. So you get a contact length of start. Okay. Now. What is going to be your radius of revolution? Well, okay, it's the y value, okay? Because you're revolving around the x axis, around the x axis. Let's just take this little segment of your arc length there. Okay? That little piece there. You're revolving this all the way around this axis. But what is the value for that? The radius of that little segment there was your y value. Okay? And now, the problem is we don't have any t's in here. Okay? Now, do you want to come up with a parametric equation so we can use that other formula? Or do you want to use this y value, which would be the square root of 9 minus x squared? I think they want you to use parametric equations, okay? Because that's what this whole section's about. So let's see how they do that. So you can represent that uh, curve, that portion of that curve, parametrically, by the equations x equals 3 cosine t and y is equal to 3 sine t. That's a circle of radius 3, okay? But you're only going from 0, zero to pi thirds, remember? So that's how you get to that point of that. Zero to pi thirds. It says now, note that you can determine the interval of t by observing t equals zero when x equals three, yes, and t equals pi thirds when x equals three halves, which is your second point of there. Second x value. Oh, man. But that's what we had already done. Now, on that interval, C is smooth. In fact, C is, looks like it's going to be smooth just by everywhere. So C is smooth. Oops. Okay. That interval C is smooth, and Y is non-negative. Okay. And you can apply theorem 10.9 
to obtain the surface area, and that theorem was S is equal to 2 pi times the y value, and the y is 3 sine t, is integral from 0 to pi thirds, the square root of negative 3, okay, take your derivative, forgot to do that, derivative of x with respect to t is minus 3 sine t, square it, and derivative of y with respect to t is positive 3 cosine t, square it, okay, and the 3 sine t was your y value. So let's pick up and go from there. Uh, I'll probably let them do too much of this, but uh, so this will be 2 pi times the integral from 0 to pi thirds, okay? Actually, let's take the 3 out of there, make this 6 pi, okay? And here you have a sine t, now square that, and what do you get? Square the first one there. Pretty easy. Nine, Nine sine squared t plus nine cosine squared t. That's looking pretty interesting, isn't it? Excuse me. dt. Get out of there. All right. So this will be six pi times the integral from zero to pi thirds sine t. Now, background at nine. Right? So that you get? Second? It'd be 9 times 1. Yeah. What's 3? Three? 3. Exactly. This thing here becomes a 3. Okay? So let's make this 18 pi. And you have sine t dt. Whoa! Did it get that simple? So I'm going to come up here and do it. 18 pi times the integral from 0 to pi thirds of, well, why would I do that? Let's go on and do the antiderivative of sine t. It's the antiderivative of sine t. Help me, somebody. Okay, I heard a cosine t. Negative cosine t evaluated from 0 to pi thirds. Okay, so this will be an 18 pi. Now, what is cosine of pi thirds? Help me somebody. Cosine of pi thirds. Still our good old unit circle here. Yes, cosine is one half. Okay, so it's a minus one half minus, what's the cosine of zero? One. So it's minus or minus, which is plus one. So this will be 18 pi times one-half, that would be nine pi. Yes, that's what they got. Yes? Down here. Here. Right? Is that what you mean? Where would that come from? That was your y value because you're revolving around the x-axis. That's what's revolving around, and the y value is three times t. So the sine t was here. The three we had pulled out. Good deal. We finally finished ten point three. 
Homework exercises here include 5 or 7. They're both at Calc Chat. 5 is at Calc View. Any of the odds, 9 through 17, they're all at Calc Chat. 13 is at Calc View. Either 19 or 21, they're both at Calc Chat. 19 is at Calc View. Either 23 or 25, they're both at Calc Chat. Uh, 27 or 29, they're both at Calc Chat. 29 is at Calc View. 31 is at Calc Chat. Any of the odds, 33 to 41, they're all at Calc Chat. 35 is at Calc View. Any of the odds, 43 to 47, they're all at Calc Chat. 43 is at Calc View. Any of the odds, 49 to 53, they're all at Calc Chat. 51 is at Calc View. Either 55 or 57, they're both at Calc Chat. And then you choose 59 or 61, they're both at Calc Chat which possibly would lead you to a paper topic. Descartes is mis mentioned here. The folium of the Descartes is mentioned here. Even though you don't know about the homework, the Witch of Agnese, Agnese is mentioned here. And it has nothing to do with witches. It's just a bad translation. Uh, then you can do any of the odds 63 to 67. They're all at Calc Chat. 65 is at Calc View. Uh, 69 or 71 are both at Calc Chat. 73 is an ex exploring concept with some writing. You can look over that if you want. It should be something at Calc Chat. And same with 75. I didn't notice that. 73 and or 75. Uh, 77 should be at Calc Chat. 79 should be at Calc Chat. Any of the odds, either 80, no, any of the odds 81 to 85 should be at Calc Chat. Okay? 87 should be at Calc Chat. 89 is at Calc Chat. 91. Any of the odds 91 through 95 should be at Calc Chat. 97 and 99 are true false. You can certainly take a look at those at Calc Chat. That's all we're going to do in Chapter 10. Are you all satisfied? Are you happy with that? Please say yes. Okay. Now. Not going to do polar coordinates and polar equations. Let's move on to chapter 11. How are we doing on time? I don't have two minutes. Okay. Let's just see. Oh, sorry about this. I forgot that we still had some of this to do. And this is what we had left to do. Um, we, I, I pulled the three out, so did they. So that gives you 6 pi times the integral from 0 to pi third. Sine d. And then when they square this, you get 9 times that. That is 1. And square root of 9 is 3. So why didn't they pull the 3 out too? I don't know. Yeah, there they did. Minus 18 pi times the cosine of t. And evaluate that from pi thirds, 0 to pi thirds. And that gives you 1 half minus 1, which is minus 1 half times the minus, one, minus is 9 pi. Okay, I forgot that. Okay, so let's discard and we'll move on to 11.1 and we have one minute. Well, it may take a minute for PowerPoint to open. Looks like it's trying to take that long. Okay, here we go. Let's go from current slide. All right, chapter 11 is vectors and the geometry of space. 11.1 1 is vectors in the plane. So everything we're going to do here is two dimensions, x, y. Okay? We'll objectives here are to write the component form of a vector. That's the way to go with vectors, folks, component forms. Perform vector operations and interpret the results geometrically. We'll do a little of that, but it's so much better to do it in component form. And write a vector as a linear combination of standard unit vectors. That's going to be pretty easy, too. How we do it? Time up. So we'll start next time with component form of a vector, which is this one right here. There are a bit of 
definitions, so we'll hit those. I think you're all familiar with this, so this should go quite quickly, I think. I don't do anything very quickly, though. All right. So anyway, let's end.